Good morning, church. Good morning. Remember the Sabbath Our day is to be holy. Six days shall I labor in all thy work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work. God nor thy son, nor thy daughter, nor thy man servant, nor thy maid servant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. For in six days the Lord made the heaven and earth, the sea and all that in it is, and the rest of the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord bless the seventh day, and all of it. Uh, community. 
to do, so please come out and enjoy the evening with us. And it's from 6 to 9, or 10, 11, whenever you want to go.
back on April the 7th. When? April the 7th. April the 7th. That's a Sunday at 11 o'clock. And he's going to give us more principles on how to be financially um, free. So you might say, well, I've already gone through uh, a spiritual uh, finance class or, you know, I, I, I'm at, I am practicing, I have to slow down. I'm practicing that, you know, at home. But you know what? I just finished a short Bible story on Daniel 24. And they talk about Nebuchadnezzar and remember. So Nebuchadnezzar was given insights into how awesome God was in chapters 1, 2, and 3. And guess what? He forgot. Mm -hmm. It was not until chapter 4 that Nebuchadnezzar uh, uh, was finally able to keep it in his mind that God, there is only one God. <coughs> You may have started out really well on your finance, um, free, financial freedom journey, but I'm sure at some point you got stalled and you forgot and you let the ball drop. Well, let's pick that ball up again. Let's Amen. get back on it. Amen. You know, God is not going to give up on us, so let's not give up on him. Amen. We can be financially uh, free. And the information that our brother Terry is going to give us is priceless. Amen. For you, your family, and more importantly, for you to share with someone else. Amen. So the stewardship department wants you to be blessed and energized. We want us to rally around our first um, principle of stewardship finances. And not only us individually, us as a church, but we want you to spread the word. You can be financially free. Uh, because God has promised. Amen. So um, I hope you receive a blessing today. And please come back on April the 7th. Thank you, Stewardship Department, for highlighting us, keeping the focus before us, uh, especially on today's stewardship emphasis. Now, at this time, we're going to call Sister Ethel Marks if she will come forward and uh, share with us <coughs> uh, personal ministries uh, emphasis. Thank you. 
from 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 6 through 10. So let me ask you all something. How many of you all have something maybe like, I don't know if you guys would have this because I had it growing up, but a piggy bank. You know what a piggy bank is? Okay, so Sean, do you have one or had one? Awesome. Okay. <laughs> um, anybody else? Do you guys keep your money like in a special place? Sean, do you keep your money in a special place? I keep it in like this little thing, like a box and a spoon and stuff like that. Okay. Inside of it is my money and stuff. Cool. Okay, so let me tell you guys something. I had a piggy bank in my room. And it sat on my dresser, and every day I would look at it. And I, I didn't really know how much was inside. And um, I had like a temptation to want to know how much was inside so I could get it, grab it, shake it. Because <laughs> I used to like to hear that sound. But I didn't know how much was in there. And honestly, I don't think I was putting much money in there. And I really think it would have helped that my parents would have kept it in their possession. Because guess what I did? One day, I had to be about you guys' age. I got that piggy bank, and I got something like a fork or a butter knife, and I cracked it open. And I was disappointed. Sean, rest of you, why do you think I was disappointed? What? was I wasn't adding to the bank and that's the issue and the other issue was the temptation to crack it open early and um, it would have been helpful had my mom and dad kind of just taken the bank out of my room but that didn't happen <laughs> so I wanted to tell you what first Timothy chapter 6 verse 6 says it says yet true godliness with contentment is accept in itself great wealth so when you are content and satisfied with what Jesus is doing for you, you'll be content. You won't need to crack, crack open that jar or that piggy bank early. Um, God teaches us in his word as long as we have him and keep an attitude of Jesus Christ, he's our source. And with him, we are to be satisfied because of him. So even now you can start making good financial decisions with the help of Jesus, helping your parents save for you. By the time you're an adult, you can have a good savings. And you might be just saving for different things. You might be saving for college. You might be saving for a car one day. I don't know, but whatever it is, you need to pray to God about it and make sure that your parents are also involved so they can help you with um, those financial decisions. So does anyone want to pray? Father, I thank you for this day. I thank you for all the children that got to come. And Lord, I ask that um, all the things that we have in our bank, you know that you, we don't have to open it early because we know that you will help us in order to have more things in our bank account. 
cultural acquisition, illiteracy, and geography. We in the United States are so blessed to be able to assemble, to study who we want to study, uh, I mean, to, to worship how, how and when we want to worship, and to listen and study. But through a AWR, Adventist World Radio, non-internet broadcasts can be heard by three quarters of the world <coughs> population. Think, you can imagine that, three quarters. That's 75% of the world. The target audience, audiences are non-Christian listeners in the highly populated and less evangelized areas of the world, such as Asia, Africa, the world, uh, Africa, the Middle East, and the Eastern Europe area of the world. We take these things for granted, but people can listen privately to the voice of hope in places where evangelism is prohibited by law and sometimes punishable by death. Also, they do not need to be literate to access the global message. In many of our target areas, radios are much more available and affordable than televisions or Christian print. We also have many studios that operate Bible correspondence schools, through which they can communicate with listeners in their own languages. AWR receives well over 100,000 letters, phone calls, text messages, and emails from listeners, and many more listeners are prevented from contacting due to security issues. AWR churches and listeners clubs have been created, and thousands and thousands of people around the world have accepted Jesus as their Savior as a result of the AR Dove programs. Will the elders, uh, the deacons, come forward to lift the heart?
worship service today. And we can think of no better person to invite to come and encourage us other than Elder Randy Terry. Amen. Elder Terry was born in a suburb of Washington, D.C. and graduated from Columbia Union College at Washington Adventist <coughs> University with a double major in accounting and business administration and a minor in computer science. He became a certified public accountant in the year of 1992. Randy started working in the Treasury at the Columbia Union Conference. Since then, he has worked in the Treasury at the Chesapeake Conference, Treasury and Trust at the Carolina Conference, Treasurer of the Southern New England Conference, and Treasurer of the Upper Columbia Conference. In other words, he's been all over the place. <laughs> he and his wife, Tamara, have three young adult sons. Tamara, Tamara, would you just raise your hand so everyone can... Let's give her a big amen. amen. The Terry family are avid baseball fans. And the family has a goal to visit every major league baseball stadium in the United States of America. Yeah. And I hope that they have the privilege of going to the Texas Ranger uh, World Series playoffs. Uh, they would have been excited to see their hometown Texas Rangers play. They have about eight more stadiums to go the last count. And so today I would like to present to you the Texas Conference Treasurer, Eleanor Randy Terry, who shall speak to us after our special music, um, after our scripture reading, 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 6 through 10. And then our scripture reading will be led by Sister Maduna Williams. So let us read from the screen or from your Bibles if you have it, our scripture reading for this morning. Amen. Thank you. 
and the terror and the fear that they will be filled with because what they put their security in, their money, is gone. But the Bible says there's a better way. And what is God's solution to our financial problems? What specific financial principles does the Bible give to us? Let's go back to the day that God created the world. We read in Psalms 33, by, 33 verse 9, He spoke and it was done. He commanded and it stood fast. As God spoke, the earth appeared fresh from the hands of the Creator. In Genesis 2 verse 8 it says, The Lord God planted a garden eastward in the east. And there he put the man whom he had formed. It was God who created this earth. It's God who created the, the garden with all the fruit trees. It's God who gave us fresh air to breathe. It's God who gave us the colors of the rainbow and arranged them in the colors of the flowers. And it was God who provided an assortment of good food. And it's God who created each one of us. Psalms 50, verse 8, verses 10 and 12 says, For every beast of the forest is mine, and the cattle on a thousand hills. If I were hungry, I would not tell you, for the world is mine in all its fullness. This world belongs to God because He's the one who created it. Psalms 33, verse 6, By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made, and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth. For he spoke, and it was done. He commanded, and it stood fast. What God says is so, because when he says it, it becomes so. God is the only one who can create something out of nothing. And when someone creates something, they are considered the owner, the owner of all. Psalms 24, verse 1 says, The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. So not only the things of this world, but the people of this world belong to God. God created Adam and Eve to live on this planet, this planet of earth, filled with joy. To eat of every tree in the garden except for one. And he told them not to eat of that one tree. That tree was a symbol of God's sovereignty and his authority. And he said if they ate of that tree, they would die. But the deceiver who came in the form of a serpent to Eve said, This tree is not God's, it's yours. He gave you all everything to enjoy here in the garden. And if you eat of that tree, you will not die. You will just become a god, just like him. And Eve's sin was decided to be her own god. Worshipping her opinion above the authority of God. To accept the devil's lie that doing what she wanted to, apart from God, would bring pleasure. But as she and Adam found, it only brought death and pain. And that's the, that's the lie that's, that Satan continues to sell us, even today. Satan's great deception is self-centeredness. Putting one's desires above the authority of God. When you spell the word sin, S-I-N, I is right there in the middle of it. Isaiah 14, verses 12 through 14. This is talking about the Father of lies here. And it says, For how you have fallen from heaven, O morning star, son of the dawn, you have cast down, you have been cast down to the earth, you who once laid low the nations. For you said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. I will sit enthroned on the mount of assembly. I will ascend above the tops of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high. Acts 17, verses 24 and 25 says, God who made the world and everything in it gives to all life, breath, and all things. Not only is God our creator, God is also our sustainer. The Bible provides the antidote for self-centeredness, the sure cure for selfishness. We're going to be looking at seven biblical principles, financial principles of God's economics. His way of thinking about finances that may not be our ways, but it's definitely not the way the world looks at it. Financial principle number one. Since God created me and sustains my life, everything I have 
is really His. We did not decide to be born in this world. We were made by God. We were known by God when we were in when we were in our wombs of our mothers. God created us. God knit us together, and we are special to Him. And since God created and sustains me, everything I have is really His. Deuteronomy 8, verse 18 says, for, But remember the Lord your God, for it is He who gives you the ability to produce wealth. God gives me abilities. He gives each one of us abilities and opportunities for work. It's not of our own. It's something we can learn, but we couldn't learn if God didn't give us that capacity to do that. All we have comes from His hands. He is the one truly supplying all of our needs. The heroes of the Bible acknowledge everything belonging to God in some interesting ways. When we think of Abraham, he understood that he was created by God. He understood that he was sustained by God. And the victories that his, and his armies had were a gift of God. When Lot had been taken off by the, the, the five kings and Abraham went after him, he went and attacked those enemy armies as they, he overtook them and he returned with the spoils that he had gained from God. And Abraham, Abraham returned a portion of those spoils to God. And to whom did he give the spoils? He gave them to Melchizedek, the high priest of God. We read about this in, in, in Genesis 14, verses 19 and 20. He blessed Abram, saying, Blessed be Abram by God most high, creator of heaven and earth. And praise be to God most high, who delivered your enemies into your hands. Then Abram gave him a tenth of everything. Tithe is a Hebrew word that means one tenth. So one, one out of every ten. And it is an acknowledgement that God is creator and sustainer of life. All 100% that was entrusted to Abraham truly belonged to God. And in returning tithe to God, Abraham acknowledged God's goodness. He acknowledged God's blessing on his life. And he acknowledged God as owner of all that he had. We think of the story of Jacob. Jacob, who deceived his father... And he tricked his, his older brother into getting the birthright blessing. And then he had to run for his life from his angry brother who wanted to kill him. There he was, alone and penniless, out on the road. And God gave him the vision of the angels going up and down the staircase, the stairwell. And God was telling him that he would be with them and he would bless them. And in return, Jacob acknowledged God's ownership of all and his goodness to him. And Jacob replied to God, and he said, And of all that you give me, I will give a tenth to you. It's easy to promise God a tenth when you have nothing. But when you have great wealth, a tenth becomes something. But we have to be true. He was true to his promise. Jacob had great wealth, and he, re he returned the tithe to God of all his injuries. The patriarchs knew that they should acknowledge God as creator and sustainer of life by returning to God a tithe of what He had given to them. You might go ask, well, what is tithe? Well, tithe is described as defined in the Bible. And we read about it in Leviticus 27, verse 30. And all the tithe of the land, whether of the seed of the land or the fruit of the tree, it is the Lord's. It is holy to the Lord. Everything that I have is God's, and so I won't forget that. He asked me to return a tithe and to acknowledge Him as owner of all. Financial principle number two. Tithing acknowledges our deep belief that God is both creator and sustainer of life. God asked the, the uh, Israelites in Malachi 3 verse 8, Will a man rob God? Will we take things from God and, and use them as we, as we wish? Will a mere mortal rob God? Yet you rob me. But you ask, how are we robbing you? And he says, in tithes and offerings. Note that God makes a distinction between tithes and offering. Tithe, according to the Bible, is holy to the Lord. It's a tenth. It's an amount that God has specified. And with tithe, we acknowledge His ownership of all that we have. 
Tithe is a test of obedience, not a demonstration of our love for Him. Offerings, on the other hand, are free will. God does not specify an amount for an offering. Our offerings should be in proportion to His blessings to us and our love for Him. When we look at that tithe and, and in our you know, giving pattern and our tithe envelope, if we look at our tithe envelope, we're going to look at the different components of it and talk about the different factors of how the church uh, funds itself and how the ministries are cared for. So as we look at the tithe envelope, the first, um, we have what's called the personal giving plan. And so tithe, of course, is 10%. It's specified by God. The local church budget is suggested to be between 3 to 5% of our offerings. Uh, the conference portion, 1 to 2%, again, is suggested. World budget, world offerings, 1 to 3%, and special projects to give as impressed. As we look at, at tithe, as tithe is the first item on the list, and in the graph will show how the tithe is distributed and what it, what it goes for. 16% of the tithe goes to the North American and General Conference to fund our worldwide movements of this church. 9% is, goes to Southwestern Union Conference, which is in Burleson, which Southwestern Union covers the five states of New Mexico, Texas, Oklahoma, Arkansas, and Louisiana. 11% goes to the retirement plan. 4% goes to Southwestern Adventist University. 41% of the tithe is used for church ministry, where our, church, our pastors and uh, salaries and benefits are from, and also the departments that affect the local churches, our youth, evangelism, Lake Union Ranch, uh, just to name a few. 11% is used for uh, a portion of the teacher's salaries, 3% is for, uh, for publishing work, our community services, and our communications department. 5% of the time is used for administration, the operations of the conference office in Alvarado, as well as some of those uh, departments there. So these are some of the, this is why we have a conference. You know, why does the Texas conference exist? The Texas conference exists to have churches, to plant churches, and to, to hire pastors. It's to establish schools and to hire teachers. It's for evangelism, and it's for training of our members. The Texas Conference has 358 uh, congregations throughout the whole Texas Conference. And we're right at 68,000 members. We continue to grow year after year. And our tithe continues to grow. Uh, this last year we just had under $70 million in tithe that's contributed by our members. So our members are blessed and they're returning their blessings to the Lord. And they're also reaching out and we're growing very quickly year after year. So some of the organizations that make up the Texas Conference, again, we have over 300 churches and companies, uh, 26, um, 28 elementary and junior academies. We now have five academies, Lake Whitney Ranch, the Adams Book Center, and Adams Community Services are just some of the organizations that make up the Texas Conference. The purpose of the union, the Southwestern Union, um, Again, is the, the layer that covers the geographical area of those five states. Religious liberty is one of the purposes of the union. Uh, when someone has an issue with their work uh, and Sabbath observance, when students have uh, test taking uh, things that are happening on Sabbath, uh, the religious liberty department is able to write letters and to get accommodations for uh, uh, workers and students to not to be able to honor the Sabbath with not working. The revolving fund uh, is part of the Southwestern Union where uh, people are able to make deposits and those deposits are then used to loan funds to churches and schools for their buildings and their other projects. Education is a part of the Southwestern Union. The Record, uh, which is a communication ma magazine that you receive every other month, Evangelism at Southwestern Adventist University. The next uh, level of the church is the division, the North American division. In the North American Division territory is the United States, Canada, the country of Bermuda, and Guam, Micronesia Mission uh, area. So a very large uh, territory. And these are, these, this is what the division does that 
We don't do it at the conference level, we don't do it at the union level. Uh, media ministries are there. Our um, Voice of Prophecy is written. Our television and TV ministries are operated by the division. The seminary, where our pastors go to get their uh, master's degree in divinity, is at Andrews University. Sabbath school materials are, are developed at the division. Our retirement plan is administered by the division. Evangelism in our publishing house, the Pacific Press, where we can have our, our, our books and our, our materials printed. The next uh, uh, level is our world headquarters at the Adventist Church, the General Conference, which is located in Silver Spring, Maryland. And these are, this is the purpose of the General Conference, sending missionaries around the world, evangelism, Adventist World Radio, which our offering was for today, ADRA, Adventist Development and Relief Agency, Global Mission, the Adventist Review, and there are 13 worldwide divisions that make up the General Conference. And so we are a worldwide church. We're not a church of North America, we're not a church of Texas, we're not a church of Ireland. We are a worldwide mission that we, our purpose is to reach, to reach the world. Back to our envelope, uh, the next section that we have there is the church budget, our local giving. And so our church budget is a part of that. We have church school, uh, evangelism, personal ministries, Sabbath school departments, half hunters at that church, utilities, rent, and mortgage payment is all paid from your local giving. And so none of the tithe stays here at the church level. It is all sent on and the giving is distributed as, as was shown. The Texas uh, giving section and our Texas vision is called our Texas vision offering. And that's a once a month offering that's taken. And that is for uh, education, uh, building funds, and for Lake Whitley Ranch uh, development, um, the new projects that are going on there. This, we recently changed this, and since our evangelism is funded by tithe, we don't need to fund it from our, our Texas vision. And so those funds are not going into Lake Whitley Ranch. And then the, the next section is the world budget, our world giving. And this is broken into very uh, little pieces. But for the most part, 82% of the world budget offering goes for missions. So the weekly Sabbath school, 13th Sabbath, birthday thing, uh, annual sacrifice, the spring, fall, missions, uh, that's, that comes to 82% and that goes, uh, goes around the world to, to fund different mission projects. Uh, our Southwestern Adventist University receives 5% of the world budget, TV ministries, uh, 3%. Voice of Prophecy, uh, ADRA, uh, Oakwood University, Melinda, Andrews University, Chaplaincy Minis Ministries, Multilingual Ministries, Adventist World Radio, Christian Record, Adventist Community Services, Melinda University, and Andrews University all receive a portion of, of the uh, world budget. Then we have special projects. So we may have a special project here at the local church. ADRA has different projects that can be funded, local missions, mission trips, buildings, and anything else that um, we come to. So that's kind of how our church is, is, is financed. Um, again, the system that's set up and, and how, that, how that works together, how we all work together to be part of a world church. So Malachi 3 verse 10 continues this promise and it says, Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty. And see if I will not throw open the window, floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be room enough to store it. In the Seventh-day Adventist Church, the conference is the storehouse. That is where all the tithes are, are collected and dispersed. But you may be saying to yourself, I can't afford a, this luxury to give tithes to God. You don't realize how bad my finances are. I want to tell you today, you cannot afford not to return tithes and offerings to God. Amen. Leviticus 27, verse 30 says, A tithe of everything from the land, it is holy to the Lord. Tithe is God's holy money. And the further in debt that I am, the more important it is for me to obey and to test God and watch God work miracles in my life. Amen. Malachi 3.11 continues the promise, and it says, I will prevent pests from devouring your crops, 
And the vines in your fields will not drop their fruit before it's ripe, says the Lord Almighty. God is here making a promise that even the things that we have will last. The things that produce our income will last. And God will put his blessing, put his blessing on us. God promises that when we return a holy tithe, he will open the windows of heaven and pour out so much blessing, we'll not be able to receive it. God himself is making this promise and he says, try me and test me and see that I will not be faithful. But you may be saying, wait, I know people that return their tithes and offerings faithfully and they still have financial problems. How can that be? I'll tell you a story about John who's a farmer in the central states of America. He was faithful to God in returning his tithes and offerings. One summer, locusts were swarming across the farms of Nebraska and Kansas, and they were eating the leaves, all the leaves of every crop of every farm. And John prayed, and he said, Lord, you promised to protect the farm. Please stop the locusts from eating my crops. Well, the locusts came to John's fence, and they ate all the crops on his entire farm. John was just in shock. He got on his knees, and he talked to the Lord about it. Just then, his, his neighbors, who didn't believe in God, his fellow farmers, came and said, John, you're faithful to this God, and the, the locusts ate your crops just like they ate ours. How do you explain this? And John said, well, that's not difficult, folks. Here is the explanation. A long time ago, I dedicated this farm to God. It's God's farm. And those pastures are God's pastures. And those locusts are God's locusts. And if God wants to feed his locusts on his pastures, it's okay with me. I still believe his promises. And what promises was John relying on? Philippians 4.19. And my God will meet all your needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. Not according to our riches, but according to his riches. And also 30, Psalm 37, verse 25. I was young, and now I am old. Yet I have never seen the righteous forsaken, or the children bringing bread, begging for bread. John planted his crops again, and miraculously his second crop was better than any he had ever had before. God was faithful to his promise. Notice that the reason we return our tithes and offerings to God is not to be blessed financially, although that often is a result. But the reason that we're faithful in returning our tithes and offerings is that God is our creator and our sustainer. We return the tithe and leave the results to God. Amen. Proverbs 3, 9 and 10 says, Honor the Lord your, your honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of all your crops. Then your barns will be filled to overflowing. And your vats will bring over with new wine. Principle number three. Giving with the right motives opens our hearts to receive spiritual and material blessings from God. If you open your heart to God and give, not to get something in return, but because you love God, you are opening the door to receive blessings. Self-centeredness, as we said, is at the heart of all sin. And giving is God's antidote for selfishness. One Sabbath, the pastor had, had spoken on tithe, and one of his members came up afterwards, very angry, and said, Pastor, we, we need to have, I need to have a meeting with you. And so they set up a time, and he said, Preacher, you spoke on tithe, and he took out the bills he had to pay that week. It was $280 in bills that he had each and every week, and he laid it in front of the pastor. And then he put his salary in front, $200. He said, Pastor, tell me how I can pay $280 in bills with $200 in salary and return tithes and offerings. Mm -hmm. The pastor said, well, it's clear you're going $80 in the hole each and every week. And the member said, yep, that's right. You've got it. And the pastor said, well, I'll give you an answer, but I have one question. Is your method of economics getting you out of debt? The member said, no, I'm going in the hole each and every week. And the pastor said, well, if your way doesn't work, why not give God's way a try? Because God's ways are not our ways. It doesn't make sense to us as human beings, but God has a way of multiplying that we do not understand. But we have to be faithful to Him. Financial principle number four. Giving enables us to have the deep satisfaction of advancing God's kingdom. 
The time is dedicated specifically for the preaching of the gospel around the world. We can hear stories from many countries and we can have satisfaction in knowing that we are part of a worldwide movement that's dedicated to the return of Jesus Christ. The first thing my wife and I do when we receive our check is we set aside our tithes and our offerings. Because we tried it the other way and we said, well, we'll give God what's left over. <laughs> we pay all the bills and, oh, surprise, there's nothing left. Mm -hmm. But when we put God first, the bills are all cared for. Amen. And that's, that's nothing of our ability. That's God's blessing. Us. We know that we are participating with Christ in this first final movement. Man's economics tell you, get the most you can for yourself. Get rich. Buy all the toys that you can. But God's economics tells us more others are more important. Financial principle number five. There is no greater motivation to give than the cross. How can I deny God anything? This God who created me, who sustains me, who redeemed me. Heaven's supreme gift is Jesus. And if God gave heaven's best gift, how can I hold anything back from him? Psalms 8 verse 4 says, What is man that you are mindful of him? We're just a speck of dust, we're just a vapor on this earth, but yet God created us. God knows us. God knows us by name. We are everything to him. And Romans 5 verse 8 says, God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died. For us. Christ knew what we would do, but he loved us anyways enough to die on the cross. Amen. Financial principle number six. Sacrificing for God's cause teaches us deeper lessons of trust. When I return my tithes and offerings, but I can't pay the bills, the Bible teaches me in Matthew 6, verse 33. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and some things will be given to you as well. Oh, all things will be given to us. When I don't have enough money to pay the bills, but I say, God, I don't know what to do, but I do know that I'm going to be faithful in returning my tithes and offerings. Because you said, you promised, and this is something we can take back to God, you promised that you would bless me. Because with nine tenths, with your blessing, is more than ten tenths without you. And that takes a lot of faith. That's where our spiritual lives are truly tested. And we get on our lives and, and our knees and we say, God, you have to do it. And those are just the words he's waiting for us to say. To stop trying to do it ourselves, to stop trying to figure it out, but to put our full trust in God and let him work for us. A friend of mine, if we walk by sight alone, we deny God the opportunity to work miracles on our behalf. But if we walk by faith and live in harmony with the principles of the Bible, we give God a chance to show himself to us and to the world. Mm -hmm. Financial principle number seven. The real issue is where are our affections? God does not need our money. He's the owner of the cattle on the thousand hills. All the gold and silver is his. He doesn't need it. But God wants our heart. Remember what Jesus said in Matthew 16, verse 26. What good will it be for someone to gain the whole world, yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? This is the issue. This is the heart of the issue, so to speak. Who has your heart? Where are your affections? Are they tied up in this world, in the possessions of this world? Read what, let's read together Luke, uh, what God, Jesus said in Luke 12, 19 and 20. And I'll say to myself, you have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take life easy, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said unto him, You fool, this very night your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? We can't take it with us. It can't get us into heaven, and we're not taking it with us to heaven. And God tells us here, You're a fool. You put all your thoughts and minds into your possessions. And they're not going to do you any good for the next life. Then this night your life's going to be taken from you. And then what's going to happen with what you, what you put together? <coughs> Steps to Christ, page 60 says, We do not earn salvation by our obedience, 
For salvation is the free gift of God, to be received by faith, but obedience is the fruit of faith. There are two ways that we can do things in this life. We can give all we can for ourselves. We can make as much money as we can. We can buy as many toys, cars, boats, houses. But there's another way. And when we say, it's another way of life, it's where we say, God, you're my creator and my sustainer. You sent Jesus to die on the cross to be my redeemer. Everything I have is really yours. And I acknowledge that by faithfully returning my tithes and offerings. Would you like to tell Jesus today that your heart's affections are with, with him? That you're giving him your life, your soul, and your all? Maybe you've been chasing materialism for too much and too long. But you want Jesus to be the Lord of your whole life, including your money and possessions. And you want Jesus to come into your heart, take away all selfishness you have about things. And you want to acknowledge your dependence on Him. That you want to obey the Lord. And in return, you'll trust that He'll take care of your material needs in this life. And I invite you to, to stand as we sing our closing hymn, uh, Trust and Obey, number 590. My prayer is that as each of us sing this song together, that we will commit the words in our hearts to, to commit these words as we sing the words of the song.
Don't forget that April the 7th will be a special stewardship Sunday here at Southern Worship Center starting at 10 o'clock, I believe it was. 11. 11 o'clock. On the 7th. On the 7th of April. Hello, Terry will be coming back to take us deeper into the um, aspects of, of stewardship. And I believe it will be a benefit for the whole church as well as the community and friends that you may want to invite. At this time, let us stand together as we look to the Lord to be dismissed from worship service. Father, we thank you for ministering to us about the importance of putting our trust in you. Lord, even though we need you to help us, guide us, keep us, Lord, and so you've set up a principle called tithe and offering. But Lord, it is a faith journey. So we pray that you would give us the, the spirit of wanting to do exactly what you say to do. And then, Lord, you said that you will open up the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing that there should not be room enough to receive. So, Lord, we put ourselves in your hands to be blessed by you. Now, dismiss us from this service, but never, never from your